distinguished speakers, honorable guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Very good afternoon. Welcome to the public lectures entitled Introduction to Futures Literacy, an Essential Competency for Global Citizens in 21st Century. This session is organized as a part of Chula Futures Literacy Week under the theme of Connecting Communities Through Future Literacy, Solidarity and Transformative Learning in a Post-COVID-19 Asia. My name is Chenikan Improm, a doctoral candidate in lifelong education at Chulalongkorn University. It's my greatest honor to be your MC for this public lecture session. Ladies and gentlemen, Chula Futures Literacy Week project is co-organized by Chulalongkorn University and the Thai National Commission for UNESCO in collaboration with many national and international partners. The project aims at providing academics, students, social or CSO practitioners ASEAN policymakers, government officials, strategic partners, and the public with opportunities to explore, enhance, and engage in the concept of connecting communities through futures literacy, particularly in terms of solidarity and transformative learning in the post-COVID-19 era in Asia. As we understand it, Future literacy is a discipline of anticipation that is essential for us all, every citizen. It is the ability to become aware of assumptions about the future, and mastering it allows us to view uncertainty as a resource rather than an enemy of planning. It fosters agility of the mind, allowing us to embrace uncertainty and complexity. Being futures literate enables people to use the future to innovate the present. For this reason, futures literacy has been presented as one of the four essential competencies for the realization of humanity's aspirations in the 21st century. I'm certain that all participants are looking forward to today's session because there are many informative sessions going on throughout the day so without further ado, let us begin by inviting Professor Dr. Parishat Sathapitanun, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Social Outreach, Chulalongkorn University, to give a welcome remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Parishat. I'm honored to welcome you to all the public lectures today. I'm delighted that by inviting inspiring speaker, Chulalongkorn University can create this precious opportunity of mutual learning for our students, faculty members, staffs, and all publics to our local, national, and international communities. My special appreciations go to Dr. Ralph Miller and Dr. Maya Van Lamput by introducing and promoting future literacies. They have charted the innovative ways of learning so that we may all work together for a more sustainable society. As we continue to live on in the uncertainty, one of the most important missions of higher education institutions is to serve the public by providing learning opportunity for all. Every citizen of any age have the right to education, knowledge, and skill to develop their own capacity to adjust to the changing realities of the world that is full of complexities. When we ensure this process, every citizenship can be a leader of their own and in many ways actively contributing to transform the society to be more equitable, just and sustainable. As the Vice President responsible for academic affairs, it is my humble hope that Jula can be the place that provides institutional mechanism to the environment that promotes innovative learning for all. 
it is our responsibility to nurture the new generations of leaders who care for society with understanding of global citizenship. This requires fostering respect of diversity, idea, culture, uh, and orientation for the important respect of diversity to each other. I'm quite confident that future literacy will empower us to work more for the global citizenship. I'm very pleased that to be with you today for Future Literacy Program. Please do enjoy the lectures. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Parichad, for your kind welcome remarks, highlighting the role of futures literacy and the importance of continuous efforts in introducing innovative learning to our campus and to our society as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now proceed by inviting our distinguished speakers. Our first speaker today is Dr. Rio Miller, Head of Futures Literacy, UNESCO. It is indeed a privilege to welcome Dr. Rio Miller with us today. He is one of the world's leading strategic foresight designers and practitioners. He is widely published in academic journals and other media on a range of topics, from the future of education and the internet to the transformation of leadership and productivity. He is an accomplished and innovative designer of processes for using the future to make decisions in the present and has been leading the movement of UNESCO Futures Literacy since year 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Real Miller. Hello everyone, I'm Riel Miller. Very glad to be joining you here for the Chula Week on Futures Literacy and Future Studies. Let me start my screen sharing and provide you with a little bit of an overview of some of the issues related to governance and the 21st century. So what I'm going to talk about is an introduction to Futures Literacy, why it is an essential competency for global citizens in the 21st century. And the starting point is, what are the conditions for governance and citizenship? And here I'm thinking really of, you know, what are the overarching elements, factors, conditions that we have today? And, you know, you can think of things like uh, the, the, those uh, ships that we see in the, in the, uh, on the screen with uh, the PowerPoint. And, of course, those changed the way we related to each other. They changed the, the way the world connected. Um, but so, too, did the way we uh, imagined the world around us, the way we envisaged the, the, the earth. Um, is the earth flat? Are there dragons? Are there dangers around us? Uh, and how do we incorporate those different ways of seeing the world and understanding the world into the way the world functions, the way things work? Uh, and I just want to point out that you know, this, this flat world hypothesis or, or the notion that we might fall off the edge of the earth um, raises the question of, you know, what would a policymaker do in that circumstance, in that situation? Um, how would the policymaker respond <laughs> to this danger? Um, maybe the, what they would do is they would, they would think about how to improve navigation. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, we're going to fall off the side of the earth. Uh, maybe we should get better at navigating and improve the, the steering mechanisms and the radars and all the rest. What might a scientist do? Well, somebody who, who's supposed to study the, 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 the quantifiable metrics of everything, they might try and calculate how, how much time we have before we fall off the edge of the earth. But, of course, as everybody knows, <laughs> um, this is a slight problem, is that you can't fall off the edge of the earth in that way. In other words, to a certain extent, the issue becomes how do we think about the situation we're in? What do we see? How do we understand the world around us? And this is the, the issue that I think we are confronting in many ways with respect to citizenship in its broad sense, uh, in the sense that we all belong to this planet, that we're all part of this uh, ecosystem that has emerged over uh, millions and millions of years. 
Um, and do we do we uh, feel that we have the the capacity, the ability to really engage with the world around us as we experience it? So this is not a not a question of 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 um, you know inventing it or, or, or telling a story. It's it's really what what we actually encounter and feel. And here, I think that we're encountering, and it's it's not entirely new, but it takes on different forms at different times and is relatively acute today, is that we don't seem to know how to reconcile greater freedom with collective choices. This is this conflict and tension. Um, I mean, masks are an obvious example where people feel that the collective has a certain value, but also their freedom has a certain value. How do we reconcile the two? How to embrace greater diversity without inviting fragmentation and chaos. Here we see all the time this difficulty that we have of understanding, making sense, finding the virtue, the positive side of difference and change, uh, and the diversity of the world around us. How do we create the kind of um, awareness that allows us to understand this um, in ways that are not prone to conflict and fear? How do we foster greater creativity without increasing burnout and stress? I don't need to tell most of you that the uh, mantra has become innovate, 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 and that, that, that imperative, um, uh, work harder, uh, fear of the future means that you have to really work day and night uh, to try and, and, and be more creative than ever. This is a, a deeply stressful, anxiety-inducing condition if we don't understand how, how to, to reconcile creativity uh, and, and the way we live. How do we inspire responsibility instead of imposing it? You must be, you must be, rather than saying, I do this because it's, I feel responsible. Uh, and this feeling of responsibility is rooted in my experience and in my understanding of my interdependence and my relationship to others. How do we motivate change without resorting to fear? Fear, fear, of course, is a very powerful. You, you know, if you don't, you will. This will be the end of the world. But that feels very resentful. I don't want it to be the end of the world, and I don't want to change if it's because of the end of the world. I might want to think about change if I could see it in a different way, if I could understand change, of course, as the only constant, but also find some way to welcome surprises, not just resent or, or feel uh, kind of like I've been, I've been uh, deceived because somebody promised me that there will be no surprises anymore. Everything's going to be just fine. Well, how do we, how do we become more able to integrate this very powerful everyday experience of things that we don't know in advance and we can't know in advance? How do we manage risk without hierarchy? In other words, today the risk is, 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 is you know, you, you pass the, the buck <laughs> up or down uh, and, and somebody says, well, you know, you're responsible, you're responsible, you're responsible. Um, and this approach means that we also dispense or avoid and we also take certain liberties because we think we are the ones in power, we are the ones who are responsible. And we have heard in the past in human history where the ends, we're responsible for saving humanity or creating the better world and therefore we'll do what we need to do and if it disturbs you in ways that you feel are unacceptable from an ethical perspective, well, too bad because that's the way we do it. And then how do we combine respect for complexity while still gaining a depth of understanding? And here there's a, a crucial issue related to complexity, which is that too often we, 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 we confuse, and it's a, I think a basic confusion, it's, it's a mistake, it's an error, to think that complexity is the same as complicated. A chess game is complicated, but complexity is a state. It's not up or down, more or less. We live in a complex universe, meaning it's a universe where novelty, change, the unknowable in advance happens. 
And it happens all the time. And most of that happens without humans having anything to do with it, in the sense that this is the way the universe functions. And we can still gain great depth of understanding, but we will not master or eliminate or overcome complexity. Complexity is, in fact, the resource in the world around us, which leads to this, 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 this challenge that we have of human agency and its relationship to complexity. Uh, and being futures illiterate, meaning not knowing how to use the future for different reasons, in different ways, in different contexts, it, that, that, that lack of a capability generates a, a whole series of things that are, that are, that are very painful and, and destructive. Fear of uncertainty, a bias to seeking path dependency. Think about it this way, path dependency. You know, you wait at the, for the bus, you wait for the bus, you wait for the bus, you wait for the bus, and you say, well, I've already waited this long, maybe I should wait some more, and then you wait some more. That's path dependency. It's the lock-in of things that, that, that we've already invested in and that we know. In the world that we have today, so much of our, the, the things, so many of the choices, but also the results and the experiences we have are about scale and permanency, durability, and, 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 and being uh, massified. Uh, and if you think of pyramids, of which, and, you know, or, or, or the Great Wall, or the, 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 the different monuments that we have from, from human history, these are things which, of course, are, are impressive uh, and have a huge uh, kind of functionality to a certain extent, but at the same time, they create this lock-in. They're not agile. They're not open. They don't create the, 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 the kind of uh, multiple paths uh, to doing things that would get, take us beyond path dependency. We have a fetishism of immortality. It's connected to, the, to this idea. Things must last forever. Uh, companies, uh, empires, uh, countries, uh, and even some people think people should last forever. But this, this relationship to birth and death is not, uh, uh, in a sense, optional. And it's not, in a sense, um, uh, negative. It's, it's, it's fundamental to the renewal, to the, to the, to the, again, to the agility, to the, the transformation that takes place all around us. The preoccupation with endogenous, continuous improvement, reform. Of course we want to reform things. Of course we want a better whatever, a better school system, a better, better water system. We want a better telephone, a better portable you know, mobile phone. Um, and that's, that's crucial, and we can do that. But the thing is, if we're just making the existing systems better, sometimes what we fail to notice or we get too, again, path dependent or connected to is the fact that those systems themselves have some negative aspects that cannot be escaped, that are related to the way they're structured, to their fundamental way of seeing the world. It's like the flat earth. You can navigate better on a flat earth, but that's not the problem. And so the question becomes, how do we see outside our existing borders, our existing boundaries? This is the question of how do we understand the box and how do we understand what's outside the box? And then there's a crucial aspect of futures illiteracy, which has to do with the temporality and the fact that we, we, we are inhibiting our imagination, that we want to imagine things which we think will be certain, which we think we can bet on, which we think will be highly probable, and as a result, our imagination atrophies. It doesn't uh, elaborate and develop in the same way that if we saw that we don't need to worry so much about whether or not what we imagine is what's going to happen. Because there are many different kinds of time, there are many different kinds of change, and all of those coexist, and our, our capacity to embrace that diversity depends in very fundamentally on what I call futures literacy. So this is about changes in the conditions of change, really. Uh, and here I'm, I'm putting up a, a, a Bruegel painting from the Middle Ages in, in Europe, um, uh, where you can see that you know, think life, life is, is, is uh, very vivid uh, and active. Um, but what happens when, in order to understand uh, the world around you, it becomes, to gain an understanding of the world around you, it becomes necessary to be able to read and write, for instance. The emergence, not planned, but the fruit of experimental evolutionary processes of new capabilities. So these peasants in a village, um, most of them probably in this period, didn't know how to read or write. 
But when the urban industrial world started to emerge, it became really essential, a fundamental requirement of, of survivability and, and a, a, the ability to do things to be able to read and write. That wasn't something that somebody said, aha, I have a brilliant idea, but it became obvious in, in uh, bit by bit through experiments and through testing and through the, the unfamiliar because initially people said well why should I learn to read and write I've always been okay with whatever my my mother my father taught me and it's been generation upon generation I don't need to read and write they just they just do that uh, somewhere else the, the the elite does that um, but then of course we understand that in an industrial society one of the enabling conditions is the ability to read and to write so here we're talking about a change in the conditions of change. Of course, illiterate right for free help is not going to be very helpful. Um, but what is futures literacy? So futures literacy is a capability. Fundamentally, it's a capacity. It's not a technique. It's not a method. It's not a specific uh, kind of a, a way of doing things from the point of view of uh, using the future. It's the general capacity to use the future in many different ways. In practical terms, it's about two dimensions of the world. One is risk, the guesses we make about probability when we bet on something, and the other is uncertainty, which is the only certainty, surprises and novelty. How to integrate those two? There is no way to bet on uncertainty since we cannot even give such novelty a name. So what can we do? How can we, how can we make this work for us when we know that uncertainty is all around us, uh, lots of experiments full of rich potential, full of uh, also very ephemeral but very important sense of experience and being, how do we integrate this more effectively into the way we are? And this is where you know detecting anticipatory systems and processes becomes important. And a theory of anticipation helps us to see that there are things that we can't see without using certain tools and techniques to see them. And this is obviously a, a cyclotron with the, the idea of, of detecting uh, uh, subatomic particles and the different particles in, in, the, in the physics uh, of the world around us, how to make the invisible visible. The future does not exist in the present, but anticipation does. In other words, nobody can go to the future. There's no evidence, there's no data. But what we do is we anticipate, and all living organisms have integrated time into their functioning, and all living organisms have anticipatory systems and processes. So the question becomes, how do we understand better the, the, the anticipatory systems and processes that humans use all the time? A baby cries to be fed before it can talk. Uh, 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 if you cross the street, a child crosses the street, if you cross the street, you sure look both ways and you imagine what might happen before you cross the street. You cannot survive without anticipation. But anticipation also formulates our fears and our hopes. And understanding anticipation better is really, in some ways, like understanding speech better. When we understand speech better, we think, aha, we can do something with this these words. We can read and we can write. We can, we can create the written word and, and therefore we can augment our capacity to speak, uh, the language capacity that humans have. Humans also have an anticipatory, fundamental, basic capability. How can we augment and improve that? So we can diversify the uses of the future. We use crystal balls horoscopes and superstition, all sorts of things to, to, to create images of the future. Because the future is emotional, the future is frightening, the future is hopeful, the future is full of a richness of diverse things, and we cannot know the future, we cannot go to the future. And we must understand how the, the, the structure of stories, the idea of a heroic future, the idea of what it means to win, uh, the way we tell the story of winning and losing, all of these things structure our imagination, shape our imagination, create the frames for our imagination. And of course we use something that's very familiar, which is the idea that we think of the past and we project it into the future. We have a baseline. We have the idea of uh, the plausibility. Is this, you know, is this something I can imagine based on what I already know? So I can think, is it, is it, is it you know, even vaguely possible that that could happen? which is a degree of probability. Um, and, and of course, you come up with those alternative futures, uh, and that's based on the past. But of course, one of the key aspects of the future is that it is unknowable and that it is not like the past. I like to use the example that if you, if you think of a dictionary from 10 years ago and you say, well, I'm going to use the dictionary from 10 years ago to describe today, well, you know that it's inadequate. It doesn't have COVID-19. It doesn't have TikTok. It doesn't have the... And of course, that 
That's because the words got invented. Things that were impossible to anticipate. They just didn't exist. The conditions for their emergence were not there, have come into existence. And we know that 10 years from now, the dictionary we have today, the words and the concepts, there will be new words and new things invented. And so we cannot know, we cannot even begin to think of it plausible because we can't even, you know, use that idea to create the idea of plausible. So how do we handle this part of it? And, and here, it, in my view, seems to depend on this ability that we see in this murmuration, uh, these starlings and, 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 and schools of fish and a natural phenomenon where there's this capability, an am amazing ability of the birds to see, to move. To, it's this capability that gives us the agility. In other words, how do we combine planning and improvisation? How do we become, because improvisation is not planning, spontaneity is not path dependency. Here are the challenges to walk on two legs, and I, I use a, a historical and famous example of the idea of two different paradigms, two different ways of looking at the world, reframing human agency, anticipation for the future, what we prepare for, contingent futures, what we attempt to create, plan for, anticipation for emergence, what we discover, revealing what we did not know we knew, because it's emergent, it's there, but we don't have a name for it. We have to give it a name. We have to invent that name. That's about sensing and sense-making the new, inventing the unknowable. And then to get beyond this rather reductionist collapse that we tend to have, which is very practical in many ways, and, and children, of course, do it all the time, but we make the, 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 the thing that search, seeing things, is the same as choosing things, but they're not the same. And the future is very fundamental to what we pay attention to, to establishing the menu before we choose something on the menu. And it allows us to move beyond the bias to path dependency and the desire to impose, to colonize the future, to impose what we already know on tomorrow. So this is the, the basic idea of, of trying to live in a complex universe. Uh, how to get better at sensing and making sense of complexity. Uncertainty then is not a liability, it becomes an asset, and we transform our understanding of human agency, which is really crucial to who we are, because our agency, our sense of, I can act, I can do things, I'm, I want to make a difference. These are crucial to who we understand, you know, what, how we feel about ourselves, what we think humans are, are about. And this is about creating this, this in some senses, liberating, enhancing a power that every human has. Everyone has the power to imagine. And this takes us beyond, I think, the concept of leadership, the concept of governance that have been dominant for so, so long. Uh, a kind of top-down, uh, hierarchical, uh, cer certainty-oriented uh, approach. And, and here, you, you, this image from Sampe shows you, well, the guy in front, and it's a guy, and he says, you know, I know how to get you from A to B, from the one side of the precipice to the other side of the precipice. Now, follow me. I'm the leader. Does this look like a safe way to do things? Does this look like a reasonable approach to the, to the richness of the world around us and its diversity? I don't think so. So, for me, the future of leadership, the future of global belonging, which we could call citizenship in some senses, this is really fundamentally connected to our ability to use the human capacity to imagine our anticipatory systems and processes. How we anticipate matters, it changes the present. Thank you so much and have a very good conference. Thank you very much, Dr. Rio Miller, for giving such informative and comprehensive outlooks on how the future can play a critical role in improving our actions today. Our sincere appreciation to you for broadening our perspectives and giving us novel ideas. I'm very pleased to invite our next speaker, Dr. Maya Van Limboot, UNESCO Chair on Images of the Futures and Co-Creation and Senior Researcher in Future Research at Erasmus University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Brussels. Dr. Maya is a full-time futurist, combining research with a co-creative multimedia practice. Her consultancy and research focuses on foresight in the fields of science, technology, media, culture, 
arts, and development. She produces video documents and exhibits for the Museum of Contemporary Art, Antwerp. She co-curated the group show at Contemporary Futures Institute in 2017. Dr. Maria is a fellow of the World Future Studies Federation and the Center for Post-Normal Policy and Future Studies. She is a founding member of the Interdisciplinary Visual Arts Collective OST and the Plurality University. And she serves on the board of director of the Association of Professional Futurists. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please give your warm welcome to Dr. Maya. Top of the morning to you. Good day or night all around. It's wonderful to be part of this uh, online gathering even asynchronously. In the context of this event, with a focus beyond national interests on solidarity and transformative learning, I want to speak about how we all learn from each other. I suggest that we need a global, multidirectional and non-hierarchical conversation and tailored approaches for the co-creation of images of the futures. Futures literacy may be an individual capacity, but it is about more than the awareness of your own futures, orientations, anticipatory assumptions, and models. It also requires insight into why and how others use the future. In addition, the application of futures literacy requires collective settings. In all our diversity, we are all connected and we can only go forward together. Globally, and particularly in relationship between Europe and Asia, we are already part of a networked borrowing system for familiar futures. In my work as UNESCO chairholder in Images of the Futures and Co-Creation, one of the central questions is precisely how we can improve on these systems for a more fruitful exchange that strengthens, builds, and multiplies individual futures literacy and also fortifies our capacity for collective anticipation or social foresight. I will suggest that we organize exchange and learning through participation in scaled polylogue, actually in many polylogues. We need our exchanges to be multidirectional so that the flows of information, knowledge, and wisdom can make each other's futures familiar in new ways. Bear with me. Let's look at this term familiar futures for a moment. In post-normal times thinking, the familiar future is the counterpart of the extended present and of the unthought. The three tomorrows approach we use for workshops with the Center of Post-Normal Policy and Future Studies introduces these concepts to participants who often are not actually all that familiar with any kind of futures thinking to begin with. To explore the idea of familiar futures with them, we show recognizable images from films or television, advertisements, you know, the tropes that have endured flying cars and stylized city skylines, the Jetsons. We discuss with them the ideas about the future we have because we have seen them somewhere before, in fiction or in fact. We emphasize the limits of easily accessible and recognizable futures. And we don't just do that in our workshops. In a 2016 critical Muslim issue about futures and post-normal horizons, Zia Ziadin Sardar called Kuala Lumpur a product of a colonized familiar future. More precisely, the product of Malaysia's 2020 vision, which he finds totally lacking of originality. Like today's Mecca, he argues, Kuala Lumpur is a product of borrowed futures, or what Sohel in Ayatullah calls used futures. Now, Sohel asks, 
Have you purchased a used future? Is your image of the future, your desired future, yours? Or is it unconsciously borrowed from someone else? He continues to discuss how Asian cities follow patterns of urban development similar to those of Western cities generations ago. Now, I live in a European city, the, big, the second biggest of my country, Belgium. It's a historic and contemporary port city, a centuries old logistical trade and cultural hub. The city is actually tiny and the port is huge. The past decades of its development or mutation, if you prefer, Antwerp has borrowed from the same source as the Asian cities Sardar and Inayatullah refer to. These contemporary Asian cities, already partly shaped by familiar futures themselves, are also a source of familiar futures for Antwerp now. In their project work, my students reference them too. And they also point at music from Asian bands or electronic music with specific themes. In their horizon scans, Asian trends can all too easily be transposed to European emerging issues. So we can think this in both directions. Asia is a source of familiar futures for others and others look here to find inspiration for their images of the future. Of course, really, we need to think in all directions, the African continent, North and South America, Europe, Australia, we are all part of the same world and this world can use more speculative cultures and anticipatory capacity. It's not so long ago that in an item about taxi drones, I heard the newsreader on Belgium's national television uh, state literally, for a look into the future, we have to be in South Korea. Nothing implicit, just pointing straight at it. Looking at the medic and taxi drones that were uh, presented and that will be deployed in the extended present, they become a familiar future. And here, mediated by Belgian national television. And this begs the question, is this a future we should indeed be borrowing? What may the conditions of its loan be? Where and why and when and how does this make sense and for whom? And what other alternative futures can we come up with if we don't just look at each other, but share our various experimentations and not just with flying cars, please, to let them sing together. So let it be clear that not all of the familiar futures we find in Asia are aspirational. When we think of freak weather in our mind's eye, we may see pictures of typhoons in the Philippines, for instance. Students in my course use them to document their forward-looking climate change projects. And yet again, here we also familiarize ourselves with images of community preparedness and resilience that serve as good examples. So I think the question is how we can let our futures interbreed, even mutate together instead of the bi-directional borrowing, purchasing, pushing, we can do better with multi-directional intercultural polylogues. This is what my team at Erasmus University in Brussels is working on. My colleagues and I ask how we understand scaled anticipatory polylogue, how media, art and design processes and people can be a valued part of such an exchange. And as a matter of fact, how anyone can be a part of it, because that, of course, is the most important. We dig into the concept and the practice of polylogue and experiment with various ways to respond to the need for constant generous exchange in a world that has become as small as ours. So a polylogue, what is that? It's essentially a conversation, a performance or a narrative that includes multiple voices. The term is used in literary uh, theory alongside the concept of polyphony. Bakhtin describes it as 
many different voices unmerged into a single perspective. And each of these voices has its own perfect perspective, its own validity, and its own narrative weight. For the participatory and co-creative processes that are needed to be able to shed familiar futures and bring alternative images of the future to life, the poly polyphony serves as an ideal model. It is particularly interesting because this kind of open-ended dialogue does not occur between fixed positions or subjects. It's not debate. People are also transformed through this dialogue, fusing with parts of the other's discourse. The other's response can change one's own consciousness or perspective. Dialogue can produce a decisive reply, which produces actual changes. And that is in part the idea. We don't just understand each other's familiar futures better this, in this kind of multi-directional exchange. We also become more of a family in which difference and similarity work together. So with uh, my research team, Open Time, we are accompanying different multi-stakeholder regional polylogues. Um, and, uh, each of them ends on a focused and intensive futures literacy fest. Um, we work at multiple scales and um, over time, uh, we try not to hit the ground running and with quick familiarizations, but we aim for deep collaborative exchange. And so I will be knocking on your doors to participate in this multi-scaled, multi-layered and multidisciplinary project. Do come and knock at mine to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Maya, for your insightful talk. Chulalongkorn University is a member of the UNESCO Global Futures Literacy Network as well as a candidate for UNESCO Chair. We look forward to engaging with you and your UNESCO Chair initiatives in the future. It is my great pleasure to introduce our final speaker, Dr. Suwitida Jarungyetikun, Director of the General Education Center, Chulalongkorn University. Dr. Suwitida is a professor at Lifelong Education Department, Faculty of Education, Chulalongkorn University. She was a research fellow in the Andragogy Doctoral Emphasis Specialty Instructional Leadership Program at Lindenwood University, USA, where she completed her postdoctoral training in education andragogy and learning society development. She has published many research and academic articles as well as books in Learning City society, region development, lifelong learning policy, adult learning and education, and non-formal and informal education, etc. Her most recent publications include books titled Concepts and Guidelines for Enhancing Lifelong Learning in Thailand and The Eight Pillars of Lifelong Education, Thailand Studies. May you please join me in welcoming our last speaker, Dr. Suwitida Jarungyetikun. Good morning, afternoon, good evening, everyone. My name is Suwitida Jarungyetikun. Currently, I'm a director of General Education Center at Chulalongkorn University and also an assistant professor at the Department of Lifelong Education, Faculty of Education, Chulalongkorn University. I'm here today to share with you the knowledge and the practice uh, to transform and innovate general education towards enhancing future retailate learner to become the future leaders. My presentation is divided into four main parts, as you can see in this slide. Firstly, introduction. I'll talk about the future literacy and introduction of general education at Jolalongkorn University. Secondly, I'll talk about general education towards enhancing future literate learners. Thirdly, 
I'll talk about future of Center of General Education at Chulalongkorn University as the lifelong learning solution for all. And lastly, I'll give you my, um, some of my recommendations and conclusions. So please follow me. To begin with the first part, the concept of future literacy. There has been a lot of discussions about future of education and learning. UNESCO, as the world leading organization, has proposed the concept of future literacy, or FL, as the new cap cap capability and skill of each individual to better understand the role that the future plays and what they see and do. People can become more skilled and at using the future, more future literate. And future literacy enable us to become aware of the sources of our hopes and fear and improves our ability to harness the power of images of the future and also to enable us to more fully appreciate the diversity of both the world around us and the choice we make. As, as we uh, also um, face the experience uh, together about the COVID-19 situation, so I think it is the time for us as an educator, teachers, to uh, chip our paradigm from being an education or provider that's focused on teaching to promote more on learning of the learners. So you can see on this slide, we have to chip our paradigm from teaching paradigm to learning paradigm. And uh, we have to do more to promote lifelong learning, uh, which I mean here to provide opportunity for learner to develop themselves and lead themselves in learning or become more self-directed learner. So uh, apart from uh, focusing on uh, the previous four um, pillar of education, learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, and learning to live together, I would um, uh, encourage you all to pay attention to uh, more um, learning to become, learning to change, and learning for sustainability. The role of education institution would be to encourage learners to know themselves, develop thinking potential or competence, decision making, and be able to apply knowledge to create balance in his or her life and also the others. So now let's move on to the um, general education uh, here at Chulalongkorn University. In Thai educational context, uh, general education cover courses that enhance students as human being to have broader knowledge, understanding, and appreciate oneself, others, society, and culture and nature, paying attention to the change of all things, continuously um, self-improvement, live a life uh, ready to help um, others, and being a valuable citizen of the Thai society and also the world. So here at Chular, each undergraduate student, the university required a successful completion of general education um, for 30 credits. You can see here, we can divide it, um, 12 credits uh, for um, four general education category, uh, humanities, science, mathematics, interdisciplinary, social science. So students will be able to choose three credits each six credit for compulsory um, general education, or we call general education special group, and um, 12 credit for foreign uh, language courses. So here are uh, example of um, our general education key area or um, skills. Uh, we divide it into um, subject development uh, related skill, uh, object related um, skill, and also organization related skill. Okay, and some example of the skill that we uh, aim to equip our student, uh, such as uh, learning literacy, um, innovation competence, digital literacy, future and design competence, sense, uh, sense making, communications competence, and um, 
for example, ethical competence. So here are some example of um, uh, you can call soft skill or general or generic skill that our um, general education uh, has been uh, focused. So here um, are our future vision and mission of um, General Education Center at Chulalongkorn University. You can see here that we um, aim to become a um, what we call lifelong learning solution for all. So we offer courses, um, uh, both credit and non-credit, for different target group, uh, not only for our student but also other people in the society. Uh, here, so far, our mission cover um, six main uh, points. Uh, we aim to create uh, new causes to meet the needs of people and the society. We aim to uh, build cooperation among uh, different networks, for example, at the community or at the national or international levels. We aim to improve the quality of teaching and learning, and we aim to develop more um, uh, research and development in general education. We also would like to raise the standard of our learning ma management and create a systematic curriculum to meet the standards. And, in, and uh, as you can see here, this uh, mission tied uh, to the university's mission, core values and strategic goal to focus on the future leader impactful research and innovation, and um, uh, local and global engagement. So next point would be general education um, toward enhancing future literate uh, learners. You can see here, um, uh, this is our general education courses and activity. Uh, right now, uh, we offer three, 433 general education courses. Okay, which divided into four main uh, subject category. For example, you can see um, our 138 humanity subject, uh, 121 mathematics science subjects, 91 interdisciplinary subject, 83 social science subject, and at uh, Chulalongkorn University, our generation. General education also provide uh, what we call short course program, which is more uh, inter, um, not inter, personal or uh, individual um, uh, learning. Uh, we call CU VIP activity. And so far, we have um, uh, uh, at least uh, 362 uh, CU VIP activity, which aim to uh, equip students uh, to know yourself, discover their preference, and also prepare them for the professional world, and uh, be able to enhance their character and creating value for the society. Um, and here, um, our uh, recent um, digital learning platform for lifelong learning, we uh, develop, um, we call um, CU Neuron, which is our new um, uh, latest to la general education digital learning platform. This platform um, aim to um, uh, provide students uh, with the uh, learning experience or learning pathway. You can see in this slide that uh, the experience of the learner start at the beginning at the, their registration, okay? And they can also um, select uh, the course that they want, okay? And they also receive the certificate upon their succession uh, or success or completion. And also they can um, collect the credit Okay, and they can bring their um, academic result to compare with transferring credit in general education course at Chulalongkorn University uh, in the future. So here are um, our proud digital learning platform for lifelong learning, CU Neuron. And on the platform, we offer several uh, general education courses, okay. Um, as you can see here, and um, for those of you who would like to explore our activity and courses, you can also check at our um, CU Neuron website, okay? Um, at, 
our center, we also offer other activity to support learning and instruction. Um, uh, in the past, we have general education teacher seminar, and we also offer um, general education uh, fair for the student to be able to learn and understand general education courses that offer for them. Okay. And before um, COVID-19, um, our student and our classroom uh, atmosphere more um, uh, what do you call active learning. Okay, both student and teacher not only learn the uh, capability, but uh, also learn how to design and uh, facilitate in order to apply future literacy in their study or work. Okay, and we focused. Uh, we aim to uh, provide them with. Uh, uh, my not only my set skill set but also to give them the tool set uh, for their uh, learning and maybe uh, for their career uh, in the future okay so um, uh, at the last my last point would be the future direction of um, our um, Chulalongkorn University Academic Services, um, focusing on general education center. You can see here that uh, we aim to um, give uh, a student with uh, direct experience, okay? Uh, focus more on lifelong learning for global future. And we also provide a credit bank or credit transfer, and also give them uh, the new learning solutions, okay? So here, uh, my last uh, point okay, on my presentation that I would like to share with you all is the recommendations and conclusion. Uh, as you can see here from the um, figure, okay, this is from the next skill study. They have shown that uh, uh, there are four main drivers of the future, uh, higher, of future higher education. And you can see here that uh, in the future, higher education have to focus on future skill, lifelong learning, multi-institutional uh, study pathway, and personalization of academic learning. So these are what um, General Education Center at Chulalongkorn University also gear toward. Okay, we would like to provide uh, much more um, learning experience for a student or for our learner in the future. So um, I would like to finish my uh, presentation by emphasizing that in a famous speech, uh, Nelson Mandela uh, once expressed that the power of education extends beyond the development of skill we need for academic success. It can contribute to nation building and reconciliation. To shaping the world we live in, it is the most powerful tool to change the world. So with this final word, I wish to end my presentation and continue the conversation and um, open the debate. Thank you very much for your attention. For those of you who would like to, um, who would like to uh, share your uh, practices on new approaches uh, to anticipation in the 21st century, that might transform the future with us, please feel free to contact me or visit our general education um, center uh, at our official website, general education um, at chula.ac.th. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Suvitida. I feel we have learned a lot from your presentation, especially how Chulalongkorn University continues to work on nurturing future leaders by transforming education. We understand the important role of educational institutions and how they can trigger societal transformation. I would like to express my deep appreciation to Dr. Suwitida Jarungyatikun for your insightful perspectives. On behalf of the co-organizers, I express my sincere appreciation to all the speakers today who have broadened our perspectives and given us invaluable insights on how we can work together to create sustainable futures. I trust that the lecture audience today agrees that this session has stimulated our thoughts, answered important questions, and raised 
many more issues which are worth investigating. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much again for your kind participation in the session. We look forward to welcoming you in the next program of Jula Lungkorn University's Futures Literacy Project. สวัสดีค่ะ